Welcome. You are listening to the Fat and Furious podcast. In this podcast series, your host, Steve Bennett, father of seven, best-selling author and adventurer, will be joined by 23 of the world's most forward-thinking medical professionals. Doctors, authors, and top nutritionists, where he'll share the truth behind living healthier and happier for longer. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to Patrick Holden. After studying biodynamic agriculture at Emerson College, Patrick established a mixed community farm in Wales in 1973, which today is the longest running organic farm in the country. Patrick was the founding chairman of the British Organic Farmers in 1982, later joining the Soil Association, where he worked for nearly 20 years as a director, and during which time the organization led the development of organic standards across the country. Patrick is the founding director of the Sustainable Food Trust, working internationally to accelerate the transition towards a more sustainable food system. He's patron of the UK Biodynamic Association and was awarded the CBE for his services to organic farming in 2005. Patrick, thank you for joining us again. Uh, last time we talked a lot about uh, uh, meats and whether they were good for the environment or bad for the environment. And we came up with, I think, quite a nice way of summarizing that, uh, that meat and poultry can be part of the solution or part of the problem, depending on uh, uh, how uh, that, that cattle and that poultry actually grew and their habitat and so on. Uh, today, I'd like to focus more uh, on the subject of food, farming, and health. Uh, and, and, and as you were director of the Soil Association for 15 years and founder of the Sustainable Food Trust, I want to dive straight in with a really open question to see where this goes. Give us some of the learnings of spending so much time within those two organizations at the same time as being an organic farmer yourself. Yes. And, well, sorry to interrupt. And keep telling us all about your story because if people didn't listen to the first uh, broadcast, keep telling us more and more about your story. Yes, I'd love to do that. And I'm glad that we're focusing on health because health really is what it's all about. I mean, mm -hmm. we're interested in promoting our own health. And of course, that's fundamentally linked to the food we eat. And the story of the development of the sustainable food and farming movement goes right back to a man who was very, very interested in health. He was called Albert Howard, a, a British scientist knighted for his expertise in plant diseases, mm -hmm. sent out to India at the height of the empire, 1905, uh, to teach the peasant farmers in what is now Pakistan, but what was then Northwest India, mm -hmm. how to farm better, quote, according to Western <laughs> methods. It's what we thought before we sent it. <laughs> yeah, and he got there and he witnessed uh, farming communities that were building soil fertility through composting, through obeying the law of return of wastes and crop residues. And he noticed that the plants that they grew didn't seem to have any pest problems. The pests were there, but they didn't suffer from them. Mm -hmm. And then he saw that the animals that they were feeding on these crops were also healthy. They didn't seem to have parasites, so they didn't get sick. And then finally, the people who were coarse in those days were completely self-sufficient on the products that they were growing. Mm -hmm. They were the Hunzas, and they were they lived to a hundred. They were feared fighters, and they were specimens of vigor and vitality. And he made the connection, and he coined this connection in a book he wrote on his return from India in 1940, because he spent 35 years wow. out there. And he said, "The health of soil, plants, animals, and people." Are one is one and indivisible. And it is on that study which really, through which he built his understanding and then wrote this book that I think it, we need to uh, be students now because there was no greater book written than this mm -hmm. book, an agricultural testament, which is actually still in print uh, than that book, in print because of a wonderful Indian woman called Dr. Vandana Shiva who uh, instigated the Howard Memorial Lecture Okay. And I gave one of those in Delhi a few years ago. So uh, I think this idea that health is not something which is just the absence of disease, but it's a positive state mm -hmm. which results from sound nutrition and uh, living in harmony with the ecology of the environment in which we live is really powerful. And of course, food, that's where we start. Yeah. And so the S, uh, the so Soil you're, Association. You're, you're saying healthy animal, healthy plant, healthy human, 
or the opposite today where everything's grown in chemicals and pesticides and herbicides and just goes on and on and on. You know, over-farmed, chemically produced means unhealthy animals, unhealthy plants, unhealthy humans. Yes, and just to pick up the story again, so this book, An Agricultural Testament, published in 1940, just before the, which think during the war, it was read by Lady Eve Balfour, okay. the niece of Prime Minister Balfour. Mm -hmm. She read the book, and re she was a farmer, she realised that there was something profoundly important in this book. She said, we have to set up an organisation, the Soil Association, uh, to promote this idea of the interconnectedness between farming practice, food quality, human health. The Soil Association was launched in 1946, just after the war. But even though it was a strong voice with lots of sort of um, well-establishment type people in it, mm -hmm. um, after the war, there was the, you know, realization that because of the North, North Atlantic U-boat situation where we were starved of food and other scarce resources, mm -hmm. we should try to make sure that we were as self-sufficient as possible and never risk food insecurity again. And of course, at that time, the chemicals were becoming available, the fertilizers sure. and the pesticides. So the 1947 Agricultural Act subsidized uh, crops. So if you were a dairy farmer, you got a public subsidy for producing milk. If you were a grain farmer, you got subsidy for producing grain. So, and at that time, the chemistry became available. So in the post-war period, farmers responded to this food, insecure, food security emergency, which mm -hmm. had happened during the Second World War, by growing more and using these chemicals. And really, that's the history of the post-war period. And the voice of the Soil Association, which I joined in the 70s and then became director of in the 90s, was too weak uh, to stand against this mm. great tide of subsidy and of uh, the sort of antidote to food insecurity, which has prevailed really during the whole of my farming uh, mm -hmm. lifetime. The problem with that approach of artificially stimulating growth with chemical fertilizers and then suppressing the diseases with pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, which are actually poisons, let's sure. be frank about yep. it, is that we produced, yes, lots of food, but we compromised the health-promoting qualities of that food in the process. Mm -hmm. So a colleague of Howard's, who was called Sir Robert McCarrison, was a doctor and a nutritionist, he realized that it was, there was something important that Howard had discovered in India, so he did a feeding trial. He fed some rats the diet of the Hunza, the people in Northwest yes. India. Yeah. He compared it with another batch of rats who were eating the Western diet, which is already quite refined with mm -hmm. you know sugars and refined flowers and that kind of thing. The rats on the Western diet got Western diseases, mm -hmm. died younger, weren't so mm -hmm. healthy. The rats on the Hunza diet, which was vegetables, uh, whole foods, some meat and dairy products, but mm -hmm. only in Natural, proportion to the, and, exactly, yeah, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. They were thrived and they had larger litters and they didn't get illnesses and all the rest of it. That feeding trial hasn't been replicated in the laboratory, but in a way we're replicating it uh, on a national, even international scale. We've now fed two generations of people with products from industrial agriculture produced in ways which are unsustainable and artificial stimulants of growth and antibiotics mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And look at what's happening in the population. Yeah. We have a national health service, which would be better named the National Disease Treatment Service, mm -hmm. and it's threatening to bankrupt our government yeah. because we've got epidemics of obesity and mm -hmm. diabetes and diseases of cancer and the immune system. It's very difficult to correlate these directly with agricultural practices, but there's no doubt in my mind that changes in agricultural practice in the post Second World War period have significantly contributed to the emergent health crisis. I 100% agree with you. And if you look at areas in the world where people are uh, high concentrations of centenarians, people living over 100 in remote areas, they are just living off the land like they always have done without the pesticides, the herbicides, their animals roam freely, that, so that they've got cattle and, and, and meat from, from free, you know, free roaming animals, uh, and they are living long, long lives, and there are still some of these pockets ar around the world. Sadly, not as many as they used to be. So I totally agree that, that what we eat today isn't primal. It's not what our body expects. We shouldn't be eating food from chemicals. I think that um, we talked earlier on, didn't we, about the fact that you know if you take a blueberry that's grown organically, 
it will have much more antioxidants, the things we want, the blue. The, the reason we eat a lot of fruit mainly is for that antioxidants, the vitamins and the minerals. There'd be so much more of it than if it was grown, you know, chemically. So even the quality of our food isn't as good. So give us a few more lessons of, of, of all the time. I mean, because you've been farming now for, for over 40 years yourself organically. I think you said on the first show you're the longest standing organic farm in Wales or something. Organic dairy farm in Wales, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you, we're hearing it straight from somebody that's involved with that, but also what I love about you is you, you, you do it and you're still doing it and you're still organic farming, but you've headed up these organisations. What other lessons can, can, can we learn about the state of our food? And most importantly, as consumers, what should we be doing to help ourselves live healthier and longer and sustain the planet at the same time? Well, let's pick up on what you just mentioned about the antioxidants and the trace elements mm -hmm. of the minerals, which should be present in the fruit and vegetables, for instance, that we're all encouraged to eat five mm -hmm. a day of or more and why there's been a decline in that uh, composition mm -hmm. directly related to unsustainable farming practices. The way that we should be growing these vegetables and fruits is in healthy soil. Mm -hmm. And the healthy soil is like our stomach. Okay. The soil is the stomach of the plant. Okay. And it's full of bacterial and fungal organisms which the plant actually feeds. All plants use a third of their metabolic energy from photosynthesis to mm -hmm. exude sugary sap into the root zone, which nourishes a symbiotic community of fungal and bacterial organisms. The reason it does that is because a plant needs those organisms to break down the humus or the organic matter in the yes. soil from which it derives its nutrition. And- I never knew that at all. It's a beautiful wow. story. Yeah. And if you think about it... So that's its microbiome of the plant and the soil. The soil is the stomach of the plant. Yeah. We have a stomach. Yeah. We eat food. Yeah. We have a symbiotic community of bacteria, hopefully lots of them and yeah. lots of diversity, mm -hmm. which we need to properly digest our food. It's exactly the same with the plant. Okay. And yet, the farming practices which we've used over the post-war period have suppressed this community of fungal and bacterial organisms. So we've compromised the nutritional capacity of plants. And in fact, that same process is the plant's immune system. So when we taste, and particularly aromatic carrot, which I used to grow, mm -hmm. we are tasting the plant's immune system because those secondary metabolites are what give plants flavor and smell. And we have been hardwired through our development to recognize those nutritional benefits mm -hmm. because we smell them and we yep. taste them. Yep. So we put into reverse all that system and we have to restore it. And the only way we can do that is to move from a chemical based agriculture to a biologically based agriculture. The future of agriculture will be about biology, not chemistry. It's a hard thing for farmers to accept that, mm -hmm. but I think more and more of them are realizing it because we've seen that more than half a century of industrial farming has killed the soil, mm -hmm. has diminished the biodiversity, and of course the biodiversity is a sort of metaphor, the biodiversity of our stomachs yep. is mirrored in the soil. So I get it, 100% what you're saying, but let's come back to the real world because, you know, I'm quite fortunate that, that, that my family are able to buy organic more, but it is more expensive. So how do more and more people in Great Britain today start to eat the right foods which are better for their health and, their, and, the, and the planet's health? What can they do? Because at the moment it is substantially still more expensive. It is more expensive and there are things we can do. But just to say, before I go into the things we might be able to do, it's worth recognising that in the 1970s, a third of our disposable income was spent on food. Okay. Today, it's, I think it's 9.9% or something oh, like that. Okay. So we only spend a third as much of our income today. We spend it on housing and on iPhones or whatever today, but we have shifted away wow. from putting a priority on, on food. Yeah. So that actually is something we should remember, but at the same time- Can I just stop you there? Because that, that is fascinating, I didn't know that. So that the point is, because cheaper options have become available, because of the pesticides, the herbicides, the, 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 the cows that have been raised in sheds on corn and antibiotics. And because food's got cheaper and cheaper, we've all gone for the cheaper option That's right. to give us more disposable income to buy like gadgets and, and gizmos and, and things like that. Um, because that's there, and yet what you're saying is if we just spent less on other stuff, we would have more to buy the real food and therefore would live healthier and happier. 
Yes, that's true, but I don't think we should beat ourselves up about that and just say, oh, well, we've got to spend a lot on food necessarily. We also need to encourage governments uh, to do more to make sustainable farming the more profitable option for farmers and the more mm -hmm. affordable option for consumers. Because at the moment, as you've just said, if you are wealthy and relatively affluent, you can probably afford to spend a significantly higher proportion of your uh, income on mm -hmm. food, organic food, sustainably produced food. But if you are on the poverty line, you look at the prices of sustainable food and you think, I can't spend that much more. Yep. So we, the governments have to intervene there because the polluter isn't paying and the sustainable farming practices aren't adequately subsidised. And there's absolutely no reason why if we stay in the EU, the yep. European Commission, yep. who are already thinking about this, or if we Brexit, yep. the UK could not shift the subsidies, the carrots, yep. and introduce the polluter pays principle, the sticks, to shift the balance of economic advantage where if you do the right thing, meaning farming sustainably producing highly nutritious food, that pays better than doing the other sort of farming, which is causing great amount of damage to public health and to the environment. If you think about it, why would we subsidise mm -hmm. farming practices which are causing that damage? We it's should crazy. just say no. Yeah. If you've got a thousand dairy cows and they're permanently housed, they never get out to grass, no subsidy. Yeah. If you're putting chemicals on your fields, I'm not blaming the farmers, the farmers yeah. are just doing it, so they're following the best business case. Mm -hmm. But if you say to the farmers, use chemicals, no public subsidies, yep. what do you think they're gonna do? They'll They're going to shift. It. And then the price differentiation between healthy food and unhealthy food, the differentiation really starts to level out. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, more people can make the right choice. Exactly. The, I mean, there are two other answers as well. One is that we're a big supporter uh, here at Primal of intermittent fasting, as long as you get yes. medical advice and your doctor says it's fine for you. But 5 2 stuff. The 5 2 and yeah. Michael Mosley or yeah. the 18 uh, yeah. uh, 6 or, or whichever intermittent fasting you prefer. But the reality is, as humans, that's what we've always done, feast yep. and famine. So uh, eating less meals. Also, we waste a lot of food in the UK. If we stop wasting so much and planned our meals a bit better and cook more at home, then actually we might find that we can do more uh, exactly. in terms of eating the right foods. Exactly. I mean, it's maybe 50%. You know, yeah. Some of it's on the farm, some of it's in processing, some of it's in our fridges. Mm -hmm. But part of that, I think, is we, because we don't value food. Yeah. I think there are two reasons why we don't value it. Partly it's so cheap. Yep. And secondly, it isn't really as good, if you know mm. what I mean. I mean, yeah. a lot of the food that we eat, we buy and eat today, hasn't really got a, a sort of deep intrinsic quality about it. Yes. And I think we sense that. So we think, oh, let's throw it away. It's yep. not really worth anything. And that's, an inc that's something we can do something about. But I think actually we need to produce food which is intrinsically better. Mm -hmm. Then we value it more and we waste less. Yeah. I totally agree. Uh, somebody explained it to me recently that one of the reasons the soil isn't as good as it used to be, they said if you go back, Steve, like hundreds of years ago, um, the animals would come along free roaming, they'd graze on the food, uh, on the plants. The plants, of course, have sucked up all the, the, the minerals and you know, the zincs, the magnesiums, and, and then the, the animals would roam around and poop back where they ate, returning the minerals back to the land but today, with over farming and all the pesticides, and just keep using it for you know uh, uh, without rotating the crops, we're just taking out the minerals and not replenishing. Is that is that is that true? Is that part of the problem? Or yes, I think it is, and it's interesting to reflect that some of the most fertile soils on the planet were built with an interaction of grassland and ruminant animals. Say the 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 Corn Belt, the Great Plains. That was bison, millions mm, of bison grazing in herds. Um, defecating and urinating on the land and trampling the grass and then moving on, that's soil building. Yep. So actually what farming needs to do is to replicate the soil building process that these vast herds of bison and antelope in Africa uh, caused to, to develop the soils in the first place in our farming practices. And I'm part of a growing movement of people who are practicing what's called holistic grazing, mm -hmm. where you mob graze or you graze intensively our dairy herd of 80 cows, you graze them on a bit of land and then you move them on the next day and then the grass um, grows back more rapidly but you get this kind of soup of manure and urine and grass all trampled in. That is the, the, the building blocks of soil making. So we need to listen to these and learn from these natural ecological systems and apply them in our future farming practice. And when you do, you see healthier cows and you see healthier crops. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. Composting as well. I've just put in a shed on our farm 
where we are turning and composting our livestock manures for the first time. It's embarrassing to say, but we don't have a culture of composting animal manures uh, in this country. We must develop one. Right. So I'm, I feel as if even after over 40 years of farming, I'm just at the beginning of what the kind of principles and practices we can apply to make our systems even more productive because of what I've learned during mm -hmm. that time. And we need the farms of the United Kingdom to become beacons of learning and inspiration so that the next generation of food producers can produce more healthy and vital food without damaging all our natural capital and causing irreversible climate change. It can be done. Yeah, it can be done. And, and luckily there are people like you preaching that lesson and, and, and we have, well, not so much can be done, it has to be done. It must be done. It has to be done. Yes, that's right, because farming and changes in farming practice are likely to be the biggest single influence for which we can really affect, mm -hmm. which will move us away from irreversible climate change. Yeah. So we owe this to our children to mm -hmm. eat in a different way, to understand proper ecological farming systems and support those of farmers who want to adopt those at scale and tell the government what they have to do to bring in the carrots and the sticks so that the right thing yes. pays and the wrong thing doesn't. That it, how weird it is that if you, if you farm in a way which is causing damage to public health and the environment, it pays better than if you farm in an ecological way. You wouldn't at believe moment, that. Yeah. We can change that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's frightening, we have to change that. Uh, you said something to me earlier on today and I did not know this till you said it. The, the great thing in the UK, of course, with the Soil Association uh, and you know, that organic label, at least with organic, it means it, it grew in the soil uh, and the soil was a, was a, is of a certain quality. But you said to me, some vegetables now grow not in soil at all. That was news to me. Yeah, I mean... And I think, of course, if it doesn't grow in soil, how can it be nutritious? How can it suck up the minerals from the ground if there's no soil in the first place? Yeah, I, I, I think very few people realise that if you go to a supermarket and buy standard, normal salad vegetables, and I'm talking here about lettuces, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, all the salad crops, none of them are grown in soil anymore. They're all grown in this rock wool or equivalent. It's like a sort of nutrient-holding medium, and they're nourished with uh, fertilisers in solution. And this has replaced soil-grown vegetables, soil-grown salads. And you can't buy them anymore. You can if you buy organic in this yeah. country. In America, the conventional growing lobby has just changed the standards and made it possible to grow even organic vegetables hydroponically. Now, that's the equivalent. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, whoa, 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 stop there a second. You say in America, seeing the word organic doesn't even mean it grew in soil. Now, yes. Crikey, and that's a huge battle that's gone on. And the organic... Pioneer growers are up in arms about it. Sure. A lot of pressure put on by the conventional growing industry to allow what it amounts to hydroponics. But the question, of course, it arises, and you know, somebody who would criti criticize what I just said would say, well, what's wrong with hydroponics? And I think the answer is back to this idea that the soil is the stomach of the plant, and this there's this interactive process between plant roots and the fungal mm -hmm. and bacterial organisms in the soil which enable them to produce their immune system, if you just moved away to a sort of stomach tube feeding uh, process where you're only supplying the key nutrients and not these subtle nutrients and trace elements, yes. there will be a nutritional consequence in the plant. I'm not saying that they won't taste okay mm -hmm. or appear to look good, yeah. but the soil, the soil and the interaction between plants and the soil, which is the stomach of the plant, is not an accidental evolutionary process. I think we should respect uh, this important piece of the ecology of the planet. And if we just abandon it to move yep. towards nutrition through uh, hydroponics, yep. there are bound to be long-term impacts on our Well, it has to be as far as I'm concerned because you know, there are 13 vitamins that we're recommended we should eat. There are 14 minerals that have nutritional reference values that we're told by you know, doctors globally that, that we have to have. So there's tw across the two, there's 27 vitamins and minerals that we need on a regular basis. If you're growing plants in something that's not real soil, the likelihood is we, we just can't be getting them. Just imagine if we had a law passed that if you were growing hydroponic vegetables, there had to be a label on the, on the salads. I think that would have quite an impact because nobody knows this. Yeah. Incredibly in fact, few in fact, people know this. In fact, you think about it logically, <laughs> Labeling's all the wrong way around, isn't it? We exactly. label things now to say that they're organic and grown properly and we don't label the rest. And actually, we shouldn't have to label vegetables and tomatoes that are grown properly. We should be labeling everything else. 
Yes. Why kid label a cigarette? But we certainly need a more transparent and more easily understandable labeling system. That is one of the things that my organization is working on because at the moment you go and you say, well, it's organic, what's the difference between that and LEAF and Red Tractor and all these other mm -hmm. certification schemes? Very difficult to understand the differences between them, even for somebody like me. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had a sustainability assessment, which was everything, soil, water, biodiversity, crops, livestock, everything, greenhouse gas emissions, as part of a scoring system, you know when you buy white goods in a supermarket mm -hmm. or wherever you buy them, it's got this AAA rating or yes. whatever it is, an NG rating. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to be able to have all foods uh, covered in the same sustainability assessment rating, not just in the UK, but everywhere in the world. We need mm -hmm. a common language for sustainability assessment, which then is replicated on food labels. So then you can go into a supermarket and you look and look at the score. Yes. Let's say my dairy farm products, the cheese, say, mm -hmm. has a score of 70 out of 100, and yep. you can look at another cheese and it's got 65 or 75 or whatever, and then you might be able to look behind the label, which we should mm -hmm. be able to do, transparency, and say, okay, well, this is more grass-fed, or this is, you know, doesn't use antibiotics, or it's soilless. Yep. It'll have a lower score than that. That will empower us to be able to use our buying power in a more effective way. And you could still have an organic label, but it will also have a score on it. I like that score because sometimes I hate over-regulation, but the reality is we need it now. I, I bumped into uh, a customer of ours a few weeks ago, and she said, oh, uh, ever since I've been, I didn't used to eat cheese, Steve, but since you said it was okay, I'll start to eat it. I said, oh, great, what are you buying? And she said, uh, something, bells. I went, what's that? She said, it comes this red, red plastic thing with a wrapper. I went, that's probably not cheese. She said, well, it says cheese on the label. I said, well, it's probably not cheese at all. But Well, yes, that's another issue. Of course, so, it, you know, this is... But that's where your, your scoring interested. system would come in, wouldn't it? Yes. Because, you know, quite often, you, know, you think something is what it says on the label, but often it's, 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 it's massively removed from that. Yes, and we just, you know, it's, it's, these th issues are all complicated. It probably was cheese, it probably was wax wrapped or something. But the modern cheese making methods are quite industrial, and we need to move away from those towards, I think, more artisanal mm -hmm. um, and biologically based cheese making uh, processes, which is what we're doing on our farm. So let's. And it's great that you're doing that, and, and it's great that, that, that you're standing up for sustainability for both uh, uh, the planet and, and, and health uh, for, for the humans. Let's come right back, though, to people watching right now, because you said to me earlier on today, and I thought, before we, we start to record the programme, we are just part of one big feeding trial, our generation, and, and we're starting now to see the signs of that with chronic illness uh, in Great Britain that we just don't see in some remote corners of the planet. So let's assume that most people that are watching this either on YouTube or on Sky or listening to the podcast, let's assume they kind of get it already because they, they found this program. What steps can parents, uh, people with loved ones and for their, for their own health, what steps can, should, what's the first few steps you should take when it comes to food to do the right thing for yourself and the planet? Let's have some real basic steps. Yes, I think it's evolution, not revolution, mm -hmm. because we should be honest and say that it's not easy to identify and secure um, products which come from farming systems which are truly sustainable and part of the solution if you shop in supermarkets today. Mm -hmm. So we need to encourage supermarkets to um, stock products and label them mm -hmm. in such a way that you can easily differentiate between the foods which are good for you and the planet and those which are actually more harmful. And this scoring system would do that. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a budget, whatever it is for food, and you have a certain buying prescription, you're vegetarian, maybe you're vegan, and you're thinking about wanting to eat sustainable meat where you can, mm -hmm. if you can find it, mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you do as first steps? I would say that you should take the foods that you like most, maybe they're vegetables, mm -hmm. and you say, right, I'm going to apply these principles of local, in-season, sustainable, and from producers and production systems that I can identify and are known to me to what I buy with my vegetables. Mm -hmm. And go into a supermarket yep. and see what you can do. And you <laughs> might find it quite difficult, yeah. which is sad, yeah. but it doesn't have to stay like that way because supermarkets in the end respond to their customers. We yeah. are the powerful ones. If we change, they change. I suppose if we all started, uh, and, and I did two years ago with my children, 
it, it's sad that my older two, two children, I've got two, uh, one, uh, Matt's 27, my daughter's 29, Hannah, um, you know, when they grew up, when, I was past that generation that, that grew for, uh, you know, our own garden patch and allotments. So, and they, they had no idea what it meant to grow food. Um, luckily now we're back into it with our younger children. They get it um, and they enjoy it. My yes. kids really enjoy it. They get a bit confused when that carrot comes out and it's the wrong color and the wrong shape, uh, but then they eat it and they realize it tastes great. Should we be really encouraging back to the allotment days and encouraging back to maybe even a window box at home growing some of our own food? Because the more we do that, the less the supermarkets sell and maybe then they have to change their ways. Yes, and I think you make an important point about education in schools. Um, we are working in education um, with a chap just joined us working 50% of his time as a head teacher of a primary school, Church of England primary school in the Thames Valley, uh, who has taken it upon himself to introduce uh, sustainability uh, into his curriculum without compromising his Ofsted outstanding, mm -hmm. so he's a very good school. Mm -hmm. But he realised that the education system at the moment that we have doesn't really equip children to understand the world in which they find themselves or to take action to make it a healthier place for the future. Mm -hmm. And he identified food as one of the areas where he could start. So the children grow vegetables because they're lucky enough to have some land around the school, organically of course, and he decided that he would try to shift the menu of the uh, the dinners that the, the yes. school children eat mm -hmm. as to as much organic as he could possibly achieve. Mm -hmm. He's now ninety percent organic, wow. which is amazing on school budget. On a as school well. budget, he's a, he's asked the parents to contribute a little bit more, but basically it's yeah. very little money. Well. He's achieved it by doing some fascinating things. One of the things he's done is he's got the children growing these vegetables in the school grounds, and they. You can't actually sell vegetables because you have to be BRC sure, approved and, and all this stuff. Yeah. So they give the vegetables to the uh, the dinner lady, the, the mm -hmm. cooks, because they have proper cooks, you mm -hmm. know. And they say, look, have these, and there's a trade-off. So he says, right, you can have these vegetables for free, but you spend more money on meat. So they try to buy organic meat, and they have less of it, but when they do have it, it's really good quality. He's managed to get to 90%, and the children monitor the waste. So they take the waste up to the compost, yes, they make compost, yeah, yeah. and they record it, and they do the same with energy. And yeah. it's that sort of interaction, growing food yourself, yeah. tasting it when you're a child, is what brought me into agriculture, yes. and I think we can do this with a whole generation of children. They're very, very exciting. Hang on, you've just hit something really interesting there, Patrick. I said earlier on, how do people afford organic, because it is more expensive, and I mentioned, uh, how about some intermittent fasting, how about, uh, I said, you know, uh, um, not wasting so much. But the reality is, what you've just said, that's school there. If you could just shift maybe 10 to 20% of your cost to what you grow yourself, which is much cheaper than even the cheapest yeah. supermarkets, much more healthy, but also much cheaper. You've now got, let's say you could do a fifth of your spend actually in your garden, so now it's for free. That gives you more cash to go and spend then uh, when you go shopping to get the more organic food yeah. and, and the A organic proper meat. chicken yeah. or grass-fed beef mm. or whatever it is, absolutely right. And buy less, but buy really good quality. And then you will feel better and the planet will be healing. Mm. So it's, it's very powerful, this. And so, you know, next steps, you buy vegetables and you have a local, sustainable, organic, whatever it is. Ideally, buy them from maybe a, a box scheme or a farmer's market yes. or something like that yes. because there are plenty of opportunities to do that. Mm -hmm. But also, um, go into your supermarket and say, are these vegetables grown in soil? Go to the customer service that they will not know what you're talking about. Right. Let, let's say I've got a Tesco down the road for me in Bristol. <laughs> go into my Tesco and say, I've not done this, but I will do it now. I'll go into my Tesco and say, well, tell me, are these, great, these um, salad vegetables grown in soil? They won't know what you're talking about. Could you check? And then Dave Lewis, he's the, the boss of Tesco. I bet he doesn't realize this mm -hmm. because he's just running a big business. Yes. But if he starts to, because they listen to these people, you yes. know, they've got, if 100 customers ask a question, yes. that gets right up to the board. Yep. So if people start saying, hang on a minute, your salads aren't growing anymore. So can we all, do, can Lewis, we all do this? Everybody's going to go, on the podcast what's going on or here? on Sky or YouTube right now. Can we all do this? Next time we go shopping in the supermarket, if we all, en masse, Go to the customer service desk, doesn't matter if it's Tesco, Tesco's, no, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, go yeah. and say, 
was Waitrose. This, Waitrose. Even Waitrose. Yeah, even Marks and Spencer. Yep. Go, go and, and say, was this lettuce grown in soil? Or and, cucumber, or yep. tomato, or peppers, all, the, yep. all those. Because I want yep. to know. And if they don't know the answer, we hope they'll have to record that on some system. And then, we, you know, I've always said, companies won't, Companies are there to make profit for their shareholders. And certainly nearly all the big food companies are publicly listed companies. They only have one obligation. If you're a director yes. of a public listed company, your only obligation is to maximize profits for your shareholders, not health of the people you sell the product to. So I always say they won't, companies won't change their way. No matter what legislation we put in, they will always find ways around it. They will only change the way they do things when people stop buying their product. Uh, so in other words, it's, it's, it's our wallets and our purses that will make the difference long term. And I think what Patrick's helping us do is to really understand the difference between real food and fake food, real foods that have grown in the way that they've always grown, fake foods with all the fertilizers, the pesticides, the herbicides and so on. So we have to go and start asking those questions, stop buying it, grow more at home uh, and, and really understand that most of the chronic illnesses in the country today stem from food choices. Exactly, and it's very interesting what you say about uh, supermarket bosses, because when I was at the Soil Association, I used to know them. And I had a meeting with the then boss of uh, Tesco, uh, Terry Lee, he was called Sir Terry Lee. Yeah. And I said to him, um, or I took him around a farm actually, I said, your policies are driving all these sustainable, small and medium-sized farmers out of business. And he said to me, in terms, he said, look, you need to understand that I'm between a rock and two hard places. Mm -hmm. uh, the rock is the competition. It's, of course, yeah. it's now, it's Aldi and Lidl, yep. but then it was probably Asda. Mm -hmm. um, and the two hard places are my shareholders who want me to make more money every year and yes. my customers want who cheap want cheap food. Mm. And he said, I, if I don't respond to those three forces, I'm out of a job. So I said to him, good answer. I can see that what you're forced to do is give your customers what they're asking for today, which is cheap food from industrial farming. My job is to influence what your customers do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what we want them to do is to buy more sustainable food. And he said to me, that's a good answer too, because if you're successful, we will change. Yes, well, of course. Well, yes. let's be honest. Yes. That was probably early noughties that I had that meeting with him, I can't remember when it was exactly. We haven't done enough. But now the tide's changed, hasn't it? The tide's well, turned. Well, we've seen younger generations that are happy to lobby and we see what happened in Hong Kong recently. And you know, our, children's gen our children's generation are happy to stand up and say, this is wrong. And I think very soon we'll see that evidence of what you said earlier on, our big feeding trial with our generation. My dad, diabetic, my mom, early onset Alzheimer's. Uh, 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 and what we'll see is our kids going, well, how, well, how did that happen? Why did they live to 120 in the Andes? Why did the Eskimos manage to, on just me, you know, live to this? And eventually our kids will go, well, actually, we are poisoning our planet and ourselves. We have to spend a bit more money on food and we have to grow some at home so we can spend a bit more on, on the right stuff. And, and, and you're right, the supermarkets will just follow what the consumer wants to buy. Yeah, I think there's evidence that young people in particular are prepared to exercise their collective power. And in a way, the vegan movement is an expression of that. Mm -hmm. There are millions of young people who are revolted rightly by the industrial livestock farming. Mm -hmm. What they don't know is that actually they need to understand the difference between that industrial livestock farming and the sustainable livestock farming, which we need to rebuild the soil and all the rest of it. But the point is, the vegan movement is a protest vote. Mm. And it's a mass protest vote because young people, just like I was when I was in the 60s and I was part of the hippie movement, yes. we felt the power, collective power, to do something different. And I think that there's a relationship between that movement that I was part of then and mm -hmm. 40 or 50 years later, the movement now which is going vegan. But in my opinion, the young people of today need more information about the difference between the kind of sustainable farming systems that we've been discussing and mm -hmm. the industrial ones, which we definitely need to get away from it. But it shouldn't just be about giving stuff up. It should be moving towards the farming and the food systems which are actually part of the solution. And that's what I'm so excited to talk to you about because we need more sophisticated and informed members of the public to yes. drive this change. Yeah, uh, my children's generation definitely have been 
fed this line through the media, through social, maybe in schools, that, that we have to stop eating meat for, to save the planet. Mm. And what we discussed, those that didn't uh, watch our first show, uh, was that, that, that meat and poultry can either be part of the solution or the problem. So if the meat and the poultry fed and lived in habitats the way they've always have, then actually it's part of the solution because the fact that they graze uh, on the land means that then when we then eventually plant vegetables, the soil's in a better situation. Is that, that's, got that right? That's right. But of course, if those animals or the poultry grew in sheds and, and not in their normal environment, then they are part of the problem. So what we were saying at the, in our first program was that if you're a vegetarian, for reasons of, for animal well, you know, because you love animals and ethical reasons, then great, that's fantastic. If you do it for health, if you're a vegetarian or vegan for health reasons, you're a little bit misguided because or you, you might be misguided yes. if, if you're you know because some of the animals are a problem for health. But well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. So to the, to the point of eating meat is good for you and poultry as long as it's organic and it's natural. And it's the way it's always been. I think there's no. I don't think you find anybody that will argue with that one. All those stats about cancer and red meat, they put all the red meat together, whether that's highly processed, processed Italian meats with all sorts of things in, highly processed sausages, but also yeah, they, they may be causing problems. But real meat, without where the, where the cattle has roamed free, that haven't had the injections, that have eaten the food they're supposed to eat, you know, has the good omegas. Mm, mm. You know, has the balance between omega three and omega six correctly. It's only when they become force fed that we really have a problem. So back to the, the, the overall synopsis of: be vegetarian, an ethical reason, great. Be vegetarian to save the planet, agreed. If everybody is eating, you know, cattle that have grown in sheds, because yes, more harm than good to the planet, and more harm than good for you health wise. But if you can. Try and get a movement going where you live to going back to eating all your meats, all your poultry, all your fruit and vegetables, organic and local, then eventually we sustain the yes. area, then eventually we sustain the planet. Yes, and I was telling you a rather lovely story earlier. Uh, a woman who works, has worked with me for actually uh, 17 years, Erica, in my office. Uh, she is a committed vegetarian, largely ethical reasons. Mm -hmm. And she had a vegan uh, woman who is in a band and is in her early 30s, uh, staying with her uh, for a few weeks recently. And she knew nothing about the things we've been discussing this morning. And she explained that even though she was a vegetarian, she could understand that livestock of the right kind play a centrally important role in building soil and being switching to sustainable farming systems. And this woman, had become a vegan for environmental reasons, not ethical right, reasons. Okay. And just a week or so ago, uh, she decided that she would try eating grass-fed beef again, which Erica, even though she's a vegetarian, cooked for her. So this is a person who committed to, for environmental reasons, to become a vegan, heard all these arguments and changed her mind. And I think there is uh, an opportunity for people to, obviously people need to make their own decisions about mm -hmm. these things, but. With the information, it is possible to start to look at the role of sustainably managed livestock in a different way mm -hmm. as part of a balanced system of farming and nutrition, which can combine the two if you don't have ethical objections. Yeah, and back to that health one, I've just really, just something that's just triggered in my mind, there, a bit of a eureka moment, that, that if you go vegetarian, you are definitely missing out on some of the vitamins, B12 in particular, and iron, and, and so on and so forth. But also, if you're not eating real vegetables. So you've, you've stopped eating meat, so you've lost out on a lot of vitamins and minerals there. And your diet's consisting of those plant-based foods that you've said don't even grow in the soil. Then you are so missing out on some of the most vital, you know, the word vitamins yeah. comes from the word vital yeah. for life. You really, you know, we aren't very, in the past we'd eat nutritionally dense food but if you're vegan and eating non-organic vegetables, you're really missing out on some really well, vital vitamins and minerals. I think this is playing this so-called um, feeding trial, which is not literally a feeding trial, but it's a kind of feeding trial by accident. Yeah. Take a whole generation, two generations actually, of young yeah. people, feed them on uh, food of diminished nutritional integrity, yeah. see what happens. Well, look at the National Health Service bills, look at all these yeah. epidemics of diseases we've got. And even, dare I say this, 
just look at people, particularly, mm. you know, in areas where nutrition is more of a challenge and what people are eating, a lot of fast food. The evidence is in front of us. Yes. I'm not just obesity and diabetes, but there's yeah. a sort of feeling of pallor about people. They don't look as vigorous as I remember. Mm -hmm. And I think there really are nutritional point. reasons for that. Yes. So we need to do something about this because otherwise the National Health Service will bankrupt our country. Yeah, well, we heard that from, from the uh, CEO a few years ago that, that he said that yeah, it will, even a beastie on its own can bankrupt us yeah. if we're not careful. Yeah. So we, we've, we've got like two or three things playing out here in Great Britain. We've got the overprocessed and mass carbs, which we know leads to yeah. uh, sugar in the body, which leads to insulin, which leads to chronic yeah. illness. But this under, being undernourished because we're not getting from the soil all, all the minerals that we needed. Yes, and I've even heard, I don't know if you've heard this, that we are hardwired to stop, to stop eating or stop feeling a craving to eat when mm. we have the right micronutrients. Yes. So if we're eating uh, high carb foods or mm -hmm. processed foods generally, yes. which haven't got these critical mm -hmm. micronutrients in them, mm -hmm. we may continue to eat because we're our, our bodies are trying to find the nutrients which aren't, they're nutrient starved basically, yes. so, micronutrient so, so starved. So we have uh, with a, a hormone called leptin, we have a hormone called called grelin, one tells us to eat more, one tells us to, to stop eating, one says you're hungry, one says you're full. And, and the problem with, with leptin is this, we don't know when we're told, our brain says, I'm hungry. It could be one of two things, and this is what most people don't understand, it could be one of two things. It could be the brain saying, I need more food for energy, but it could also be the brain saying, I need more nutrition. In other yeah. words, I'm lacking, like when ladies are pregnant, they tend to have a craving for something or other. That's something lacking yeah. in their diet that the baby, mm. you know, the growing baby needs. So the brain, so I want to teach a lot of people, get up in the morning and take a multivitamin. Take your omega-3, take your turmeric or whatever, and you might find that your hunger goes away. And the hunger might go away because actually what you thought was hunger for just mass of food and cereals and energy might not have been that at all. It might have been the brain saying, I need good nutrition. Mm -hmm. And when we eat food that's lacking nutrition with carbohydrates, 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 what happens is... It, it, it fills us up, but it doesn't, it doesn't mm. tick any of the boxes on good nutrition. Well, it's interesting being a livestock farmer, milking cows as I do. I should be milking my cows tomorrow morning. Um, you watch cows. There's a lovely book, actually, called The Secret Life of Cows. Which, okay, uh, I'm gonna... The sister of uh, my colleague, Richard Young, she's called Rosamund Young, okay. published, uh, republished last year, and it was in a big Waterstones okay. window thing. I should get that. Wonderful book. You watch them, and when they're sick, they will selectively graze from hedgerows, plants which they don't normally eat. So blackberry leaves, interestingly enough, yeah. cows that are not quite right, they yeah. will often eat blackberry leaves. And then also a lot of conventional farmers notice that if you put nitrogen fertilizer on your grassland, it, it's very mono in terms of nutrition. The cows will often graze around the edges of the fields where the fertilizer didn't go. So cows know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they like diverse uh, nourishment from a, a biodiverse mixture in the pastures. And uh, so there's, a, there's an innate intelligence in them which will enable them to self-medicate. Isn't that a beautiful Isn't thing? Isn't that incredible? I mean, you said to me off air as well, you said that, uh, you know, a cow looks healthy, is, uh, his coat shines and she is a sheen and shiny when he eats real grass, but then becomes dull you were saying after, 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 after you've milked them, maybe you tell that story that you were saying earlier, well, it was quite interesting. Yes, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, scientists do rat feeding trials is because they have a metabolism, I think it's 27 times faster than a human mm -hmm. being. And of course, cows are not as different from us as that, but they're still pretty rapid. And the great thing about being a dairy farmer is that you are conducting a daily feeding trial. Sure. You feed the cows whatever they're eating. In the winter, of course, it might be hay or silage mm -hmm. and other stuff. In the summer, it's field by field grazing, and some fields are more milky than others, so you will see a milk yield benefit within hours of turning wow. the cows into a, or in a particularly fertile field with the right soil biology, you will see a sheen on the animal, on the coat of the animals, literally 12 hours after giving them some particularly luscious and delicious grass. So you see this daily relationship between nutrition and health reflected in the condition and the vitality of the animals. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah, are you effectively saying that, we always say you are what you eat, but because cows 
metabolize the food faster than we do, what we're saying is we, we're in this food experiment as humans, but because we're so slow at, uh, at metabolizing our food, we just don't see it so quickly. But with the cows, instantly, not instantly, but within a few hours, you're seeing that effect of good nutrition and good food. That's right. And of course, it, it's, uh, the researchers will say there are always what I think they think call them confounding factors, which means that we, you know, cows don't smoke, drink and have emotional stress. Well, they might have emotional stress, but it's easier to rule those out if you're managing cows. Whereas if you do a nutrition cow, mm. a trial with people, uh, somebody can say, well, you fed them, you know, soil-based lettuce or whatever it was, but uh, the person was drinking every night yes. or whatever else they were yeah. doing, taking drugs or something. Yeah. So it's difficult to isolate the particular health outcome from the diet unless you can sort of control what they eat and everything else about them, which is not so easy, of course. But yeah, it certainly is a, a person who looks after animals. I can say I'm totally convinced that nutrition and health are intimately linked, yes. and we should take note of that. Yeah, I mean, back to your point then, and, and I 100% agree with you. Uh, we had uh, Malcolm Kendrick on, and we were talking a lot about doctoring data. He wrote a brilliant book called uh, Doctoring Data. And he was talking about how, you know, all these headlines about shouldn't eat this, you should eat that. Uh, and he said nearly all of them are nonsense because back to, back to what you just said there, you, you can't, you'd have to do it controlled, randomized, you'd have to be interventional, you'd have to have a thousand people that are almost the same age, same sex, you'd have to divide them into two random groups, you'd have to change one thing and one thing only, so you eat green beans and you eat uh, uh, food from a uh, uh, you know, chemical, fed pig or whatever, change one thing and one thing only, and then wait years and years and years to see exactly. what the outcome is. So, and the trouble is, then we get newspaper headlines that say you should do this, you should do that, and, and they're nearly always wrong is what Malcolm taught us. Don't ever believe any newspaper headline around food unless it's controlled, randomised, uh, interventional, and they use the right statistics because whether you're talking one type of statistic or another type makes all the difference. The reality is, listen to somebody like yourself that has been a farmer for 45 years with an organic farm that has headed two organisations, uh, your director of the Soil Association and your uh, more recent one founded the Sustainable Food Trust. You understand this, and I think what we're saying is it really is important for the planet and our health to eat organically and this whole thing about meat being bad for us is correct if it's done mm. in, a, in a factory type environment. But realistically, we do need cattle on the land, we do need sheep on the land. And as long as they are eating naturally, living naturally, that's actually good for our health. It's actually good for the planet's health because that even makes the vegetables long term more nutritious. Yes, I am saying that. I'm saying that from my own direct observation. But in saying that, I'm not against uh, good. Uh, proper science-based research. Mm -hmm. I think you can have intuition and you can have intuition derived from observation and you can have research and we need all three actually. We do need more research mm -hmm. into the nutritional outcomes of properly sustainable agriculture but we can't afford at the moment to wait decades yes. until we finally discover what many of us already have observed mm -hmm. or intuitively felt that sustainable farming practices without the use of poisonous pesticides, fungicides and herbicides are going to be better not only for our health but also for the health of the planet. Mm -hmm. Because we were in the last chance saloon in yes. terms of irreversible climate change, biodiversity loss, etc. Yes. and arguably the emergent public health crisis. Yeah. So we better take some steps anyway, apply the precautionary principle mm -hmm. and at the same time conduct research because yes. we can do that. And eventually, we will, I'm sure the science will validate what our intuition mm -hmm. is already telling us, and indeed our own bodies. Yes, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not against science, because we need science, but it has to be independent. We need to know if there's any yep. hidden agendas. Yep. You know, the, this whole thing at the moment, even headlines on BBC, 10 o'clock news, you, know, the, you look where the research came from, it came from the, you know, the, the Lancet. And then you look at that particular piece of research and look at all the conflicts of interest. You know, I'm all for research, but my goodness, it has to be yes. totally independent, real research. And, and also then you've got to look at where you're reading it because newspapers are there to sell newspapers and headlines tend mm. to be better if they're negative and not positive. So, Yeah, um, I, I think that some of these things are absolutely influenced by vested interest. But sometimes it's just a kind of accident, really. You get a... Uh, an orthodoxy which 
becomes really entrenched. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, take the Eat Lancet report. Well, yeah. there's a discussion about how much vested interest there was in that, but certainly not all of the authors were, had vested interests. Uh, very few of them, if any of them, had knowledge of agriculture, mm -hmm. but also they were playing into an emergent orthodoxy that plant-based diets and, uh, are good, animals are bad, because ruminants emit methane, that's bad, therefore give up eating them altogether, David Attenborough says so, etc., etc. And to challenge that orthodoxy is difficult. Sure. So, you know, the BBC environment correspondent, maybe he didn't read the report, looking for a headline, goes on to the Today programme. I, I ring up the Today programme and say, hang on a minute, the headline doesn't reflect the report. It's, <laughs> it's just a the surge of, it's just, it just carries on. And you, you stand up and you say, no, that's wrong. And it's quite hard sure. to, to stand against this. But mm -hmm. I, think, I think that discussions like this help. Mm -hmm. I believe they do, because no, I think that people listen to, I'm a practicing farmer. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I've got a, monopoly on insights into this, but I think there are not enough practitioners whose voices are influential in government policy, in research communities, and in commissioning research. And that really has had a negative impact on what the public understand about mm -hmm. the relationship between farming practice, food quality, diet, and public health. Yes, We need them all. Working it's not together. just about stopping out of the farm gate and saying what we eat is an influence on our, on our health. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. It's also how it was produced. Absolutely. So I'm going to finish because we're coming to the end now. You're sitting around a table with my seven children because I always find it's easier to talk to somebody else's children because they don't always listen to their own parents. That's so, so true. Uh, so I always struggle to, in fact, getting my kids to listen to me is one thing. That's difficult. Teaching your parents yeah, is even, it, it, it's even harder. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But so, so you're not sitting talking to your children. You're sitting, I've asked you to sit down with my children uh, of various ages from the age of four to 29 What's the final bit? How can we summarize what they should be doing in terms of what they eat for their health to live healthier, happier for longer? Well, um, make it your primary concern to understand more about the relationship between farming practices, food quality, and your own health. Forget everybody else's, start mm -hmm. with ourselves, because mm -hmm. we are the powerful ones. We are. Farm is like a cell in the global food system. We're a cell too because we're a, a unit of consumption, but also mm -hmm. we are power. Yep. So we start with ourselves and we apply the principle of positive health in relation to our food buying. And we selectively uh, purchase food products which come from properly sustainable farming systems, which are also linked to what we now know about, you know, what a healthy diet is, vegetables, uh, low carb, all the rest of it, but we connect back to the farm and the farming story and the story of biology as opposed to chemistry and move away from that industrial farming system. And if we do that, our uh, preferential purchasing will enable the renaissance of truly sustainable farming throughout the world mm -hmm. and it also have massive benefits to our own personal health. Have your food produced by farmers, not chemists and... Scientists, I think, is what you're saying. I'm not anti-science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not. Have your food created by farmers and not uh, in a laboratory? Yes, we don't. We want to move away. I mean, these meat substitutes and yeah. all the rest yeah. of it, you know, impossible yeah. Yeah. burgers and all this. Yeah. I don't think they're probably going to deliver. They certainly, they're not soil-based. Yeah. And probably they're not very good in terms of energy. Yeah. So we, we need to ask, we just need to ask tough questions mm -hmm. and verify stuff for ourselves because we are in, as I said, a very precarious situation. And yet, because of all this power of the internet and mm -hmm. new communications channels, such as this one, to get mm -hmm. messages across, we can uh, turn the tide and move in a more sustainable direction, hopefully very quickly. As always, Patrick, it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, hopefully, uh, everyone's learned a lot at home. Hopefully, it'll help you influence your food choices, because it's your food decisions, where you spend your money that will eventually influence the supermarkets. And hopefully together we can all live healthy and happy for longer and at the same time uh, help protect a very fragile planet. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book 
Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.